All right, we are live. All kinds of phone releases are coming soon. The Note 8 is on the horizon. We'll be running down the top rumors and leaks before we head out to cover the New York event. Huawei has sent out invites for the Mate 10, and Nokia has launched the Nokia 8 with Zeiss cameras in tow. There's a lot to talk about this week, so make sure you're charged and ready for episode 266 of the Pocket Now Weekly. This weekly podcast, recorded August 17th at 3 p.m. Eastern, is a show where we dissect and discuss those gadgets that make our lives mobile. Smartphones, tablets, and wearables. It's all the stuff you wished existed when you were a kid, and science fiction films were around 200 years off in predicting mobile computing. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, senior editor at Pocketnow.com, blasting the signal from sunny Southern California, joined, as always, by plucky podcast producer Mr. Jules Wong out on the East Coast. How's it going, buddy boy? I would be 200 years off if I were to estimate your age right now, because I'm going to say happy 235th birthday. Yeah. I don't even know. But, you know, we had a, we had a podcast today. So like, I mean, I had to <laughs> do it the public. So um, in the post, you're going to hear all, all the people clapping and cheering for you. But right now uh, it's only just me and possibly a few of our friends in the audience here. So, uh, with all due respect, and, and your wife too. Um, yes. Because I, I got the notification for both. So happy <laughs> birthday. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, it, I, my birthday was yesterday from the from the day that we uh, recorded this this crazy podcast. And I feel <laughs> older and more tired and decrepit. And like advertisers care even less about me now. So it's all yeah, good. Exactly. <laughs> We have officially moved out of that range where it's, you know, 18 to 30, is it like 34? So 30, yep. yeah. I'm, I'm well outside that range now. And again, I, I can feel my, <laughs> well, and I can just feel my purchasing power diminishing by the minute. Um, it's like I have this disposable income and literally no one wants to take it from me. Well, I mean, wages are still kind of stagnant and everyone's still looking at that barista job they've held for a couple right. of years now. Well, oh darn yeah. millennials and their avocado toast not buying premium luxury <laughs> goods and services <laughs> well how about we promote a uh, premium goods good or service like it's a good it's a good i think it's it's, it? it's a good which is uh has a phenomenal service tied to it i'm glad you brought that up uh mr wong because uh this week we are sponsored by Eero. Now, the single router Wi-Fi model just does not work anymore. In our increasingly high bandwidth world, what we need is a distributed system, and that system is Eero. Uh, whatever your Wi-Fi needs, Eero has the power to seamlessly blanket your home in fast, reliable Wi-Fi via e Ethernet, wireless, or any combination of the two. Eero is a mesh Wi-Fi system. You set the main unit on a flat surface. You plug the satellite beacons into wall outlets around your home to expand coverage to any room in, in your house. The second generation Eero now includes a third 5 gigahertz radio for tri-band connectivity, making it twice as fast as its predecessor. So you can do more in every room of your house simultaneously. Also, Eero's new thread radio can connect to low power devices like locks, doorbells, and other home sensors. The Eero beacon is half the size, but is more powerful than the original, making them more discreet around your home without compromising the signal. Whichever model you choose with Eero's incredible support, you can call and get a hold of a Wi-Fi expert within 30 seconds. But you might not ever need to. This is one of the easiest networking setups I've ever used. I plugged in the base station to my modem, I fired up an app on my phone, and the app connected the beacons quickly, and they even helped me adjust the position in each room for the best signal strength. Now, my home isn't super large, but it is two stories, and I believe the top story is made out of a Faraday chamber to prevent any kind of wireless signal leaving my office. So with lots of network noise coming in from neighbors, we used to run ethernet cables upstairs and downstairs to hook up slave routers to make sure we had good signal. Eero has single-handedly replaced that mess with a single Wi-Fi network. Great security access, and each beacon also doubles as a handy little nightlight. I've had it running for a week and I'm totally spoiled. Mesh Wi-Fi is the future. So um, they are giving, they are delivering a, a special for viewers of the Pocket Now Weekly. If you would like free overnight shipping, visit eero.com, select overnight as the shipping option, and enter Pocket Now at checkout. Uh, that's eero.com, offer code Pocket Now at checkout. And we thank them for supporting the Pocket Now Weekly.
Hooray for them and hooray for us for uh, working with Eero to uh, get this deal on. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, I used to run like five, four different Wi-Fi SSIDs because I would have like this slave router <laughs> just for like Netflix for our TV. And then upstairs, you would have to remember to connect to a different Wi-Fi network for faster throughput. It's all just one one ID now. And the the handoff is phenomenal. So like when I'm downstairs in the living room, I know I'm connected to the living room beacon. And then I just walk upstairs, I go to bed and I could be streaming video and it hands it off perfectly. You don't see any drop in connectivity. It's, it's surprisingly good. I, I'm, I'm, what if you want to set Nash. four different SSIDs for your Eero beacons? I mean, you, you want to torrent one thing over <laughs> the that legal stuff. In the other room, it's it's perfect. Well, I think we here at the Pocket Now Weekly do not condone the use of Eero for any illicit or illegal activities <laughs> because we what appreciate we their sponsorship and we don't want them. To be what we us. do condone is your involvement in this podcast this and is this true. Uh, this conversation that we're having right now. So uh, to do that, you want to get in while we're live at three p.m. Eastern on this seventeenth day of August by going on to uh, Twitter and uh, entering the hashtag pn weekly you can track other people who are talking about the things that you might want to be talking about and also ask your own questions we'll try and see if we can answer them throughout this show or otherwise if you uh, have a more question questionable question i guess that's one <laughs> like something of a long term that's easy for you to say <laughs> application to it. I don't know, really. I, I've been doing this for a year now, and I still can't get used to it. Uh, podcasting. No, podcast. A podcast. Pod, I, no. Podcast. You got it. One more time. You can do it. Dot com. Woo! And uh, that is the email address that uh, you can get to. <laughs> to um, I give up. I mean, folks, live <laughs> podcasting is hard, man. I know most weeks we make it look easy, but every now and then it's still gonna it's still gonna trip yeah. us up too. Podcast at pocketnow.com. You can send in those questions for those of you who are listening after we've recorded. Or if, like I said, you just want to write out something longer than 140 characters on Twitter, that would Probably be the way to the get us. Honestly. Oh, uh, but it's good times. We've already got a number of PN weekly hashtags coming in at Peter Hayton, uh, tell, saying people should sing. You know, uh, got a little happy birthday uh, message there from Peter. Okay, that's greatly appreciated. And uh, from Andrew Wallace, we can jump uh, jump into this one before we tackle the news. Hashtag PN weekly. What are the Snapdragon 630 and 660 equivalent to with older flagship processors? Right, so uh, with the 660, uh, they uh, are using the new uh, in-house cryo cores, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to the Cortex parts uh, that they use for the 630. 630 would be more akin, I guess, to the 625, but that itself has a has a, a mid-range uh, element to it in the 626, or a, a, um, a successor. So what we're really want to be talking about i guess is probably the 650 series so yeah so i know this is a little confusing but if we're talking about 650 we'd be equiv equivocating to the 630 660 i feel like is more of a more of an eight um 835 no wait it was the 820 that was the first one with the so new course I, I think i think the easiest way um because you're you're absolutely on the right track there jules i think the easiest way to kind of take a look at the differences between these various chipsets. Um, the 625 and the 630 are their mid-ranger fare. Then we've got sort of an, uh, an overlap, something that exists between the 600 and the 800 series. So for the 650, it was very reminiscent, slightly better in terms of performance than the 808 was the the before it so if you had the qualcomm 808 then you jump to the 650 i thought that was a pretty uh, a pretty direct evolution uh the same thing i think is happening here the only 660 i've had the chance to play with is on the oppo r11 which is a chinese unit and it's super locked down so even installing apps on it is kind of tricky for me because i've never used a phone quite so restricted before but that 660 seems to benchmark similarly slightly better than a lot of qualcomm 820s did so if you look at versus you know and, and install that stupid little app that you have to find in the market <laughs> and it's just ugh. 
Right. I, I I mean, I know there are other differences in, in terms of like core count and, you know, uh, die size and all those things, but it really does seem to be that the current year higher end 600 is relatively close in performance, maybe slightly better in terms of performance and power efficiency than the last year's uh, high end chipset. So I would imagine that there would be a 670 next year, which is similar in performance to the Qualcomm 835 this year. Power efficiency has to be the sharpest uh, kind of gradients to all this because 652, 653, they were not known as uh, yeah. efficient chips, whereas as opposed to 625. They were the yeah. last vestiges of Qualcomm's just dogs processors, the 808 and the 810, and this and that did affect the 650 as well. And yeah. so now we're we're just sort of on all fronts. From entry level through high end, just Qualcomm has really, really done an about face on improving uh, chipset efficiency. But it took about a year and a half before we saw the fruits of that investment. I don't think we've played with a 630 uh, yet, so or no, 630. Yeah. So uh, we want to be able to confirm that. But yeah, it looks like we're on track for, I guess, that kind of uh, two year improvement. We're talking about an 808, so that's 2015. Yeah, uh, it's still kind of a well, and the 625 know. was a late launch, too. I mean, the 625, I remember it came out first in the Huawei Nova, wasn't that the first What's phone that? to use a 625? And that was pretty late in the year, yeah. or last <laughs> or the 2015, uh, fall of 2015. I'm not sure. Hmm. No, wait, there was Nova 2 last, uh, last four in 2016, so it was 2015. So, I mean, we had a start of a legacy, I guess, yeah. <laughs> a, f- a new flipped leaf uh, in 2015. <laughs> which, that was good. Uh, speaking of flipping leaves, why don't we flip leaves over officially? That. To hear, I, I want I want a response to and I want I want something that means, <laughs> like, affirm me. I was like, what's he gonna do? What's he gonna do? I'm filled with anticipation for what what he's gonna say next. Sounds like a good, it sounds like a good idea. Maybe who knows? It could be a horrible idea. But for the week of August fourteenth, this is uh, all the news that is fit to podcast. The Huawei Mate 10 is officially queued up for an October sixteen event in Munich, Germany. The phone is said to feature 6 gigs of RAM standard 10 nanometer Kirin processor for the first time and more expensive uh, than usual price tag. Uh, we're talking about the equivalent of $600, something that really hasn't been bumping up against the, um, the I guess, the, that barrier has been bumped in Chinese uh, mobile carriers. So we'll have to see about that. Samsung has had another Gear wearable leak out. Following the swap, uh, smartwatch like Gear Sport is the Gear Fit 2 Pro that's to launch uh, just before IFA. Venture Beats Evan Blast reports that unlike the Gear Fit 2, this fitness band is actually fit for swimming, uh, has offline Spotify playback, and among a whole bunch of other features. An enterprise Wi Fi infrastructure distributor has created a Nicholas medallion called Front Row. It has cameras on it that can link directly to Facebook Live, YouTube, and Twitter for up to two hours of live streaming, or it can create a 16 hour time lapse of where you've been and you wear it. It costs $400 and is on sale from the company right now. Uh, Google is said to have paid huge sums to remain the default search engine for Apple's iOS products and Samsung's phones. Analysts expect that Mountain View will pay $3 billion to the former and $3.5 billion to the latter this year. Motorola has gotten a patent in the U.S. for a self-healing screen using a shape memory polymer and a little heating solution on a phone. If the screen should crack, in theory, it should take just a few taps around that breakage and some magic to fix it up. It's only a patent, so we'll have to see when, if at all, it gets implemented into a product, but it should be an improvement over the Shattershield solution they have right now. Finally... That Nokia 8 that we've been drooling over, or our, our group has been drooling, uh, drooling <laughs> over for the past uh, several months, has been launched with flagship specs, a dual camera monocolor combo at back, and both these. The capability of taking pictures, video, and live streaming from cameras on both sides of the device, of course, you have to call it something both these groofies weefies uh, yeah 
uh, Europe should see it in September at around 599 euros. All right. <laughs> that, was, um, that was a hard bail there. <laughs> Groupies, somethings. I don't know. And then you sort of just tapped yeah. out. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, it's, we shouldn't, like, you've tried branding the stuff before. It's, it's not yeah. going to happen. You're not going to do it. Well, and, and it's like, and it, it's kind of up to them is if they can kind if they can deliver it in a way that really sort of resonates or that really takes off. Uh, it, we well, already have a pushing, you know, market points here. So to mar uh, two market points. So, so we already have a, a tweet in here from David ba 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 Baptista Silva. Uh, things real Nokia flagships had that the eight doesn't. Uh, Qi charging, an AMOLED display, and a dedicated camera button. Terrible start for HMD, hashtag PN Weekly. I don't know that it's terrible, but there are a few things there that I think are a little concerning until we look at that. This is a, this is expected to launch for 600 euro, some, yes, somewhere in there. Euro, uh, so the standard version, there's 128 gig, uh, standard 64, but there's 128 gig. So that's the average price, they say. I don't know. I'm I'm feeling like this is not a terrible position because this is just spitting distance from like a one plus five at this point, isn't it? Like you have expandable storage, you've got or does it have expandable storage? Did they mention that? Uh, yeah, it has uh, up to two two fifty six. So I think and that they that... actually did give rated splash resistance IP fifty four. Um, it's, it's great, but I mean, it's uh, practically it's only good for maybe rain or like some. Well, yeah, but but like we said before, it's it's really like I'm just excited that they told us, you know, they didn't just put on some moniker of like drizzle resistant. That's the actual IP rating. Consumers have an expectation now for how durable their gadget should be. And when I'm hearing that, you know, this, this is going to be put together, it's got a reasonably decent battery size, a 5.3 inch display. I don't know. I'm, I'm feeling like this, this, is a, this isn't the most exciting, obviously, but this isn't a terrible way to kick off uh, a new flagship series from this Nokia label. Yeah, I'm going to take, you know, um, not offense because I don't feel that strongly about it, but, you know, a, a little uh, aside from uh, David's point here, because uh, we're talking about standard, you know, a lot of standard uh, hardware affair from uh, Foxconn, which is a manufacturer partner of uh, HMD Global, who mm -hmm. are both behind the Nokia brand these days. And given that, you know, they wanted to go for a metal something that has not been <laughs> i mean we haven't really talked about nokia as a metal manufacturer except for maybe that c1 tablet that they had a couple of years ago i mean mm -hmm. it's, really, it's been that uh, standard design of plastic and hard hardness you know uh yeah. so cheap charging would be would be out of the ball uh ball field i guess for that uh <laughs> and uh, amoled AMOLED, I mean, we're we're in a tight situation for AMOLED uh, in this market. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think that definitely gonna... feels like one of the major compromises for trying to arrive at this price point. Is I'm sure that the, the camera button, I think. Yeah, it's more it's more of a valid thing. That was no, one of Nokia's uh, things, but who knows what might have happened because Microsoft did transfer a bunch of design patents uh, to Nokia, but yeah. It's only 500 pieces. Who knows what the other pieces that we do not know of yeah. uh, include. Well, and we knew they weren't getting the branding, you know, so they weren't getting clear black back, but maybe the technology just it's couldn't the be. Maybe a camera enough. button. Yeah. The shutter. <laughs> I wonder what the, I wonder, like, if it's going to just be called, like, Nokia camera now for their, for their camera. <laughs> maybe. I, th I mean, they, they already have the app up, uh, you know, because uh, they, they can update it uh, on the Google Play Store instead of having to do it through uh, software updates. So, yeah, it's just, um, I, I think it's going to take time, obviously, but we're, I, I'm excited. Uh, just it, it does, I, I mean, for a lot of people, I mean, we're seeing phone companies make some really bold and daring design choices. This feels a bit more conservative. I don't think anyone would disagree there, but 
I, I kind of feel like this is probably the right step to soft launch the Nokia name again and start building up an expectation for what they can achieve. From uh, from at Rena Chan, well, the first Lumia series lacked a lot of features too. It took until the X20 Lumias for it to get nice features, hashtag PN Weekly. And from Peter Hayton, I'm trying to work out who and why HMD included the Bothy feature. To me, it seems like a real gimmick and may not help. I mean, a lot of manufacturers have played with both front and rear camera broadcasting though. I mean, that was actually a, a, that was a really fun feature to play with. I know when we were reviewing the Galaxy S6 Active, and like mm. trying to live stream going down a water slide with the front and rear camera on at the same time. And then the splash of water hit the screen and like it ended the broadcast before it really started. Um, Did, but but, but a lot of manufacturers like, have played with that. Not Mate 10, Mate 9. Mm. Uh, like It was like that big push where it's like, oh, you can Facebook Live right from the camera app. You know, I, yeah. I think more of the uh, manufacturers are starting to link up to those APIs. And uh, I mean that's what the that's what the front row is for right like if you if you're a hipster or well not really hipster but just a <laughs> apathetic millennial are, are you hating on millennials again do i need to go and buy more avocado toast come on you can, you on. can buy all the avocado toast you want it's good it, it's fine but like I don't but know. but I I don't think a company's wrong in this day and age to really be making selfie features a major part of the discussion. I I think that's actually a pretty smart consumer play. And when you see like just I and what I'm hoping is that we see some of the same microphone acumen that we had on phones like the 1520 because that surround sound recording I don't think anyone's topped how good that was implemented on the 1520 and the 930. So if we get an Android device with decent front and rear broadcast capabilities and the ability to, uh, to, to, to play with surround sound audio recording all at the same time, like that could be really fun to play with. It could be. And uh, I mean, we're playing around with all these. Everyone's been, you know, uh, HTC. Uh, it's, it's iPhone, I guess that's really not been the one that's uh you know multimedia creation it's just tap and go and uh, you're done for them yeah. so it's it's that familiarity meme that you've been hitting on in terms of the camera app layout and uh, the feature set i mean it really took a little little I mean, we haven't grown warm to the whole um zoom lens and uh right i i don't i don't think we've it's it's one of those it's like 3d touch so um yeah, it's just I'm not I'm not sure if uh, we're going to evolve or advance uh, in terms of uh, being more involved with uh, our multimedia creation. Yeah, well, and that's an, that's another thing to mention too. Is I'll be curious to see how they implement the, their dual camera system. I mean, I thought it was a nice shot in the arm for Motorola to go with matched sensors. It's been a huge uh, benefit, I feel, for Huawei phones, and it looks like uh, Nokia is doing something very similar. Slightly smaller image sensors, but hopefully, we'll get some really good software processing, depth of field effects, uh, black and white photography, photo effects, things like that. So again, I'll be really curious to see how that's implemented. I think there's going to be a lot, if, if any part of this phone is going to have unrealistically high expectations, it's going to be on the camera performance with that Zeiss label. Indeed, indeed. Um, let's uh, Zeiss away from Zeiss and Nokia for a second. Sure. And talk. We can, we can turn that into a verb. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying so hard in my brain to <laughs> word. Like, I this think is my yeah, it's 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 like putting word one word in front of the other, like a little um, chain, <laughs> you know, trying to like yeah, center word, blocks. Words words are hard. This is yeah, true. no, just me today. So sorry. Uh, I'm going to try and make this less of a problem as we transition to Google and um, how we're yeah. like all paying for it. I guess we're all paying for uh, the option to uh, do this whole sa like, hey, it's a galaxy, and I can use Google on it right away from the main screen. Also, iPhone too, where it's wait, does I'm not sure how the iPhone would really work because like it's a preferred search engine app. Like, is it is it getting top promotion at the App Store or, or what? Because I don't know. Is it is it like a Safari thing too? 
Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's what they're getting at is is uh, didn't Apple threaten to switch everything over to Bing and then that kind of just vanished, like people stopped talking about it. And that's one of the things I think these companies have always had a little bit of leverage over Google and it becomes like, a license, not a licensing deal, but something akin to a licensing deal where you fire up your phone and you have an expectation that when you hit a search bar, you're just going to be sent to Google. They're synonymous with search. And so it, it would be kind of a nuclear option. I think a few people could be upset by opening the search bar on an iPhone or a Galaxy and being sent to a Bing search results page. But they always have that as a threat against Google and how Google's ad metrics work. That's something that I think Google takes very seriously is they should be synonymous with desktop search. They should be synonymous with mobile search. And so it, it's almost like it's not extortion, but it is kind of like, hey, Google, it's a, it's a really nice search engine you got there. It'd be a shame if someone on uh, Galaxy couldn't find it is what I'm saying. So... Uh, Maybe was, make what the uh, this is a terrible Italian stereotype, and I apologize to well, the viewers and listeners of the Pocket Now Weekly. Good fellas, or 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 um, <laughs> the other movie that I can't think of aside, uh, it's it's a bit it's Sopranos. Damn it! Ugh. Yeah. Anyways, this brain is not working. Um, let's talk about um. Yeah, well, I was I was about to transition to something, but I didn't even finish my point. God damn. All right, so I'm getting in the way of myself. Let's pretend that didn't happen. Hello. Anyways, um, <laughs> without eights, I think, is something that we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. I do want to pat out a little bit more on uh, what we saw with the Gear uh, Fit 2 Pro, though. Yeah, definitely. As a, as a sort of way to, uh, you know, I mean... We saw IP68 waterproofing last year for the Gear mm-hmm. 2. Five atmosphere, so you can actually swim. I don't like swimming has taken a really long time in order as to be like um, uh, prepped for or or supported as a means of uh, you know adapting to fitness technology. Yeah, uh, it was one of the first, but they've kind of squ- squandered their lead. Um, Apple Watch and and now it's just you know between Apple and Samsung I guess really so I don't know what what do you think about uh, two options uh, this year because <laughs> we have the Gear Sports which is supposed to be more of a smartwatch thing right and a Gear Fit Two Pro the mobile band well I no I definitely think there's some merit <laughs> excuse me I have this dry cough and I apologize and I've got these little wispy coughs. We're apologizing for everything this show. Yeah, it was like we. Uh, I I apologize for our existence, and um, it's just really sad. Uh, no, I think there's definitely some merit to offering different solutions. Like you know, I really like my Huawei Smart Watch, but it wouldn't be the best fitness trainer if I were more fitnessy inclined. And I think Samsung actually has the, a good idea on their band. So when we see this Fit to band uh you know it it really looks to me like sort of the next evolution what we always wanted from a microsoft band you know uh really uh taking into account different types of exercise not just a lot of these things i think are 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 focused more on step counts so walkers and runners get the lion's share of uh, of attention for new features and support and all of these other types of weight Uh, um, of weight, uh, I was going to say weight training, all these other types of fitness activities like weight training, cycling, swimming seem to be afterthoughts for a lot of these products. Um, I thought the Microsoft band was the first good step in a major tech company trying to address some of that oversight with how it would um, interact with different workouts. And if Samsung can kind of spiritually continue that discussion, then I think that's a huge boon for the fitness industry. I'm still kind of surprised. We talked about this on the Board at Work podcast. I'm kind of surprised that we haven't seen um, like a more fitness apparel getting into this space for customized solutions like sensors woven into compression gear, you know, like your, your compression shorts, your compression top that have like heart rate sensors built into that and then can track muscle movement so that, you know, maybe you're really trying to do a lot of workouts with yoga or Pilates to see, you know, like temperature or skin electrical conductivity, you know, things like that, that can help augment the fitness education side as well. Um, you know, this, this notion that we can achieve everything with a couple sensors on a wrist, 
I think we need to start expanding out of that. But at least for Samsung's lineup, I think this is a step in the right direction. Indeed. I mean, I mean Under Armour and all the other uh, clothing outfitters still have to figure that out. I mean, it's still kind of a bulky solution that uh, they have to deal with. That they have to, uh, if they're we're talking about clothing, that we have to take care of so that doesn't you know stretch and you know launder improperly right. no i mean there's, there's a lot going on i'm not saying that it's easy it's just we've seen what who was it, it was google had that that tech demo with levi's wasn't it levi yeah, they were yeah. Doing... it was like a card uh, jacket and it was like oh we, you just have to rub the wrist uh while you're breaking or something to uh, order an uber later or like one of those things but, but i think there's room to create more of a personal area network in general like i'd much rather have tiny little sensors that clip to my shoes than trying to count my steps from my wrist where as soon as i'm pushing a shopping cart or my daughter's stroller like i just didn't have any steps that day even though i walked across disneyland five times <laughs> you know so i mean like i just think there's room i think there's room to expand beyond just the wrist and this isn't really anything that i think is critical of samsung more just the fitness industry in general. Um, but from what I see from Samsung, I'm really excited that they are making a bigger point out of talking about other methods of exercise. Um, I don't think any, the only company I've seen making a similar claim was Misfit. So I think it was the Misfit yeah. Ray. You could buy a plugin for the Misfit app, which was supposed to reconfigure your Ray so that it did a better job of tracking swimming strokes. Um, but that's still just like, like the most basic kind of step tracker. It wasn't like you also had heart rate info or any type of customized workout strategy directly from your wrist. So again, I think Samsung's on the right track here. Yeah, and uh, just uh, one more topic, uh, which I found pretty interesting in the wake of uh, all our Moto Z2 Force coverage, and that is the whole patent with the uh, shape memory polymer is what they uh, continue to use. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, I mean, they filed this years and years ago. Like, it looked like, uh, I think, uh, one of our um, uh, derivative uh, vias uh, said, like, it looked like an Atrix uh, device that they used in the drawings. For the <laughs> right. So it's like, okay, um, how long has this been in the making and when can we see it? Because this whole idea of, okay, we're going to use a plastic, a very easily scratchable plastic for shadowproof. Uh, proofing uh, it's st it really hasn't worked out this year uh, to the critics and you know it really has made kind of a controversial phone it, i think it's a possible scale for for some consumers yeah. so no i agree what's interesting is you know this this is a really science fictiony idea i love the i mean even the the patent diagramming <laughs> just looks super i mean it looks futuristic and cool and like yeah i absolutely want that what i think is curious how do we control for phones that now would have to have self-heating elements to bond and fuse pieces of broken screen back together and what will that do to the cost per unit of a device as opposed to um if we were to take the Moto Z2 Force as it currently exists, and we had a really good first-party solution from Motorola for a glass layer that we could stick on top of that screen. Um, or, I mean, just imagine like what they could do for marketing. Like They've got their basic protector, which is kind of like a Gorilla Glass or a hardened glass. And then we've got our premium protector, which is like, you know, synthetic sapphire. And just imagine you could charge out the wazoo. The margin on that would be insane just because you could call it sapphire. Um, <laughs> we wouldn't have to worry about including other components in the phone that are rarely used, if ever used, only used when you damage the phone. I think that's that's a lot of cost to add to a device for something that's not going to be used, hopefully not going to be used very often, as opposed to, yeah, I had to spend another $45 on a Sapphire screen protector because I smashed my Z2 Force, but the actual screen's fine. I just need to replace the front cover. You know, it, it, for something that that is that works better than like a third party add on, maybe it's even accounted for in the frame that runs along the border of the phone. You could do something really interesting there where there's a little bit of an edge or a lip so that it fits perfectly and it's designed to, to be as easy to install and as perfect to install as possible. That I think would probably be an easier and 
um, a more profitable solution for this than than en re-engineering our phone screen displays to have overly complicated heating elements to fuse broken screens back together. I'm just not super positive on this idea. I mean, maybe if they, you know, took that sapphire material and uh, re-engineered the whole top layer of that shadow shield thing, maybe if we if they did that as like an optional upgrade replacement, they yeah. would still be selling them instead of not selling them because so because low sales have effectively, you know, just like like they they said uh, to us exclusively at Pocket Now. Hint, hint. Hello, hi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, they're they're not selling them anymore. They're not selling their replacements because yeah. so few people have bought them. So you know, if there's no profit there, um, they might as well go for the over engineering. I agree, it's kind of a uh, you know too much. Uh, but in that aspect, you know, uh, it, as long as I think it's more user friendly, like it's right there and they know what to do with it, uh, it's. It, 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 I think it's just easier and um, you know more efficient. It's no, not the th best there's way. something really there's something really techy cool about saying like, hey, if you smash your screen, you can fix it, you know, without having to take it into. Well, the I use it because you have to like I you still have to deal with two day shipping or going to Best Buy or whatever right. to have to actually uh, replace the thing as opposed to doing it right there and then. But you know, I think that's but that's just me. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't think it's just you. I think there are a lot of people that would think that is a cool feature. But again, it's a cool feature in a vacuum. When we look at the realities and the practicalities, I mean, look at you know people complaining about the price of the Moto Z2. But part of the price has to include the engineering and the uh, the implementation of the Moto Mod system, which can't be licensed licensed out to other manufacturers. No one else is jumping on board that idea of modularity. So Motorola and Lenovo have to eat and build in the cost of that Pogo Pin data connectivity, the software developing for every Moto Mod so that it's a seamless experience. You slap it on the back and the phone knows what to do with that hardware. Every piece of that has to be accounted for in the price of the phone. Because it's not like there's some other post phone purchasing subscription cost service that you can use to get more maybe, money out of consumers in the future. Maybe, maybe, but I mean, you know, if it, if, it, if you're not going to, you know, do something that has a guaranteed, um, you know, link to it, then right. I guess why, why even bother doing it in the first place? It's, I think there are some things that just need to be offered at a branch. Um, I think even at the $800 ish price that we're talking about for the, uh, Moto Z2 Force, it's still, uh, it, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> no, I mean, so, and, and, that's, and that's what's tricky is because at the same time, I think a lot of enthusiasts are wanting to see new stuff, right? We want, yeah. we want to be excited by technology. We want to see something, a new feature that really like just blows our minds. And I think if you were to show someone their screen healing for the first time we ever saw something like that, it would, it would, it would be, you know, jaw agape, just incredible to see that on a multiple mobile device. Like, the accounting work because you, you got the margins you you set the margins up just <laughs> do the math. I, I i really i really need a motorola numbers guy to come in here and tell me like well this is how much the phone costs this is margins and this is what we're going to do to make it make it cooler and sexier um because i i just don't yeah. see where this is going to be consumer feasible but if we saw like the tech demo on this i think we'd all be tripping over ourselves to talk about how cool it is yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, you can do that by going on to, uh, well, actually, you can't do that because we don't offer anything or we don't offer that kind of what just happened. But um, I'm trying to uh, say you can see full details on these stories and more. Just hit pocketnow.com and look for the podcast section to get to this episode's rundown. And you can chat with us about what you're reading on with the uh, hashtag PN Weekly. Also, be sure to check out Jaime Rivera and the Pocket Now Daily on our YouTube channel. Now, I'm trying to get our guest on because uh, they're, they're actually somewhere on the line here. But um, I'm trying to you know see if the, they're able to uh, get in. And uh, apparently someone's asking a question or uh, one of their representatives is asking a question. Hello, this is Inside Baseball. My name is Jules Wong and he's Juan Carlos Becknell. Um, 
we're just trying to see if we can get them in. So uh, in the meantime, so we have uh, just a minor technical difficulty here and we're going to try and get this sorted out because we're trying to have uh, an expanded conversation. Someone sent us an email, which we weren't really prepared to explore for our listeners. Take the wheel podcast um, about accessibility options. And it's something that we've been wanting to pay more attention to something that we've been wanting to expand on as a topic of conversation. Uh, there's a certain focus in uh, talking about consumer electronics, and I don't think anyone would be too surprised to hear that you sort of focus on sort of the 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 most widely known and accessible parts of the phone, you know, things that are going to affect the greatest number of people. But there are, are whole communities of consumers and whole collections of customers who have different uh, needs uh, for interacting with mobile data and services and have different uh, maybe potential barriers for interacting with those services. And so uh, we're hoping that we can start expanding on some of that conversation while we've been talking about some other science issues, especially digital mental health, uh, smartphone and data, internet addiction, and uh, other ways that we can kind of help improve the landscape for future technology services. We, we don't wanna see people left behind. We wanna make sure that people are along for the ride, as many people are along for the ride as, as we can kind of fit in our 21st century data services boat. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to get this guest on and see. Uh, We've been trying to uh, coordinate this. Apparently he's on vacation. Um, oh, and I've, we're interrupting his vacation. So, but I've been working through his representative and it's kind of like, you know, it, it's a, it's a game, a little telephone and a little uh, tech intelligence, especially with hangouts because, um, you know, it's not intuitive kind of tool. Yeah. I mean, we use it every week for, you know, this, this on-air broadcast. So, um, you know, we're <laughs> Uh, and, and and like we we should put use it in big bunny ear quotes uh, you know like we're it, always it, kind of jumping through hoops to make sure it doesn't blow up in our face yeah yeah um uh i want to see if we can actually tease uh what i thought i mean all right so if you were to think about the no dates because we're going to talk oh. about that i promise we are okay. <laughs> um in maybe like three words what would your th uh, three words be Three words for the Note 8. Man, I'm put on the spot. Um, hmm. I would say... Boring. I'll no, no, no. I was going to say bigger but fragile. Bigger but fragile. We have more of a screen yeah. there. At, yeah, uh, so there's, there's it's, it's the thing that that has concerned me. And, and uh, if we're going to tease anything, we do have a, a new Pocket Now debate video coming out on Friday, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, Friday afternoon, um, where Jaime and I debate the merits of the note as a productivity platform. And I'm gonna I'm gonna hide who's in who's debating for and against that premise. You'll just have to tune into the video. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I, I pulled my trusty Note 4 out of retirement, and I don't know that I've felt many phones that kind of have that same notion of business-grade durability. You know, classic Motorola's were kind of built on that. The, the Note 4 was built on that. And moving over to glass, curved glass on both sides, infinity displays, you just don't have the same confidence in chucking it in a briefcase, making sure it's in your check, your, your you know, on-plane luggage running around trying to answer business queries, you know, you're holding suitcases. Uh, there, there's a certain notion of business productivity that I think the Note is walking away from, or has been walking away from since the Note 5, uh, in favor of a more generalized consumer approach. And is that really as necessary when we've got phones like the Galaxy S8 Plus? You know, we already have the big screen, the curved edges, the pretty phone. Maybe it's time for the note to revisit some of the more durable businessy kinds of designs that we've had for notes in the past. Yeah, I, I mean, Samsung has made a point. Uh, its executive, one of them, has made a point uh, that uh, you know this would be a media consumption device as opposed to anything really productive. And you know, you draw out the S Pen. What are you supposed to do with it? Yeah. Uh, are you supposed to you know? tap on you know a spreadsheet or draw a little something or other a little doodle 
I mean, it's really up to the customer base that actually adopts it. And if they're finding that, you know, more gamers are using it and they're, you know, enabling these game recording features and other features that are not, uh, you know, necessarily suited towards enterprise or towards, I guess, productivity in general. Then well, isn't, um, isn't that been one of the things that's been really difficult to kind of keep talking about? for consumer electronics in general. I mean, look at all of the features that come out and people cover them sort of as a tangent or in a, in a really shallow way, you know, like, oh, this phone can do this thing. And they mention it, but they don't really explore the use of it. They don't really explore what it really means to engage with that feature, to engage with that service. Um, I'm trying to think up of some examples right now, but I mean, it's kind of like if you had a dual camera phone and you just took a couple normal photos and you didn't really talk about you know photo editing or productivity or anything like that and you're missing what that camera can bring to the market and i feel s pen often is the same it's like a it's like a galaxy s8 but it has a stylus you're like well <laughs> that's that's not really the full discussion on a product like that we'll but, get into that discussion soon enough so yeah because uh, i you. see we have a new guest joining uh joining the hangout uh, a few teething pains and getting us all set up here um, I'm going to expand my window so I can better see everyone in the Hangout. And uh, Mr. Holtzman from AARP, I believe you should be. Yep. All right, and you're all set up and ready to jump in. So you, you are the, the Senior Vice President of Marketing at AARP. I have that title correct? No, Senior Vice President of Market Innovation. Market innovation. Excellent. Okay. Thank you for correcting me there. That's actually a pretty important distinction for what we're going to be talking about. Um, just real quick, especially considering that uh, our audience is probably a little younger, my age and a little bit younger. Um, what, uh, what, how would you describe the mission of an organization like AARP? Well, the overall mission of AARP is to enhance the quality of life for all as we age. So it's an ageless mission. Uh, you just got to be 50 to get into the club. <laughs> so, um, but to enhance the quality of life um, involves many different things. Um, and where I'm focused and my team is focused uh, and therefore AARP is focused is um, to identify and to spark innovative products and services and to encourage more relevant and better, more consumer friendly products and services that will enhance the quality of life by addressing unmet and undermet needs, particularly in the areas of health security, financial security, and personal fulfillment. So, I mean, obviously, a major part of our conversation here at Pocket Now is focused on mobility, mobility technology, smartphones, um, and, and getting people inter, uh, engaged with those types of services. Um, and, we're fo and we're focused on mobility in the other sense, ensuring that people can get around. <laughs> right. But that, that has become a major part of that, that interaction, hasn't it? Is the, the, these now... We, it's hard to envision life now without some access to some of these tech services. We're seeing more retailers and adopting like tap and pay, you know, so that you're using your phone more proactively as opposed to only reacting to changes like from emails or text messages or something like that. Um, what are some of the uh, some of the more recent adaptations that AARP as an organization has met? I mean, I just recently went on the website to see. Mm -hmm. I, I was very surprised to see th this incredible portfolio of discussion topics um, ranging far and wide from entertainment to, you know, food okay. to lifestyle. But, you know, I didn't see that one bullet point, that one category just for technology, you know, or science or something like that. Um, how have you seen that adaptation unfold, especially during this electronics revolution? Still there? Uh, I, I, I think I froze on you for just a second there. I, I, are you still able to hear me? Yep. Okay. I can now. Okay, I, I think you're back on my end too. So yeah, that, that, that um, sort of evolution of, of ARP relating to some of these more technologically focused uh, consumer areas. 
So, uh, you know, first of all, uh, you know, there there are just the myths that, you know, older people, um, you know, are, are not online, are not um, engaged with technology, don't have an interest in technology. And and those are absolute myths. You know, the first thing is, is that, um, it, it, you know, do you know who Vint Cerf is? I do not. Vint Cerf is the father of the Internet. He's, okay. in his seven, he's in his 70s and he works at Google. He's a VP at Google and an evangelist for the Internet. And Vint, uh, you know, says when people say, well, aren't older people afraid of technology? His response is afraid of technology. What are you talking about? We invented technology. <laughs> you know, when you look at the cell phone and mobile, you know, who is it that invented that? That's Marty Cooper who did it in the late 60s, early 70s at Motorola is still alive and who uh, played a role actually in the design and create bug phone, which was the first, you know, mobile phone, cellular phone targeted at making it easier for older people, had larger buttons and things like that. Um, and, it, and it's actually um, produced by a company called Great Call, which just had an exit of over $400 million. So um, this is a huge market. People over 50 um, are responsible for, you know, over 53% of total consumer spending in the United States. They are one of the largest uh, purchasers of technology. People over 45 are responsible for 71% of all patents applied for in the areas of information technology, materials sciences, and life sciences. Uh, so even the economic value and contribution, the economic contribution of those patents have yet to be fully uh, realized. Um, and the longevity economy, if you were to envision a standalone economy that was solely driven by the consumer spending of people over 50, would be $7.6 trillion, making it the third largest economy in the world. And that's just in the U.S. after China and the U.S., it, at, you know, the U.S. and China, and over $3 trillion larger than Japan. So, <laughs> so you know, and, and well up close to 90% of people over 50 are online. Um, you know, people in their 50s and 60s. Uh, I'm talking to you on one of my two iPhones. Um, <laughs> I'm 63. I'll be 64 next month. And many of us, particularly boomers, grew up with technology in the office. I mean, I've been on computers since 1984 when the first compacts, uh, you know, made their way into uh, my office. So, nice. um, so yeah, I mean, I had one of the first portable, uh, you know, computers. It was a compact. It looked like a sewing machine. And some people called it a, uh, you know, I, I used to call it a luggable because it weighed about 25 right. pounds, but um, had a tiny little screen and had floppy disks and things like that. Um, so, you know, the first thing is that there is this myth that older people aren't engaged with technology, and they are. They've been engaged with every new type of technology that has entered the uh, the market, you know, since they were kids. And first it was, you know, it was the TV for in the post-World War II era. And then every other adoption from, you know, VCRs to uh, DVDs to uh, CDs um, to, you know, uh, smart TVs to computers to laptops to mobile to smartphones. Um, you know, people over 50, you know, have have bought a good chunk of those. So let's 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 first, let's first acknowledge that. <laughs> I, I believe I believe we can take that as red now. Um, okay. I, I think because I think what's sort of germane to that conversation is one of the points that you brought up, like talking about some of the concerns of more senior members. We got maybe I, I think part of the market got locked on that notion that, you know, senior citizens need cell phones with larger buttons. And then we kind of stopped with the general mind share of what it takes to make sure that all communities, I mean, not necessarily just senior citizens, but other people facing uh, unique challenges, maybe That's they're right. vision based or maybe they're hearing based are, you know, sort of 
are stopped from entering certain certain markets but there's sort of a joke perception that well what you need is a jitterbug and big buttons and that's that's how you sell a phone to seniors what are some of the other uh needs that you know especially i mean again from the focus of aarp membership but that you're hearing you know that might be a barrier to entry something that's not being fulfilled currently when we talk about newer emerging services so the first the first thing is the issue of design and you touched on it by pointing to bigger buttons and i think that you know for somebody my mother's age who's 87 uh, larger buttons are actually an important thing. And in fact, a smartphone with a, with a touch screen actually is a difficult interface for o- older hands. Um, and there are physical changes to the fingers that, that make it so. So um, bigger buttons that, that are push, that, that is clearly to a group of people. And to your point, not just people who are older, but, but people who may have vision issues or, or, or other issues. Um, I think that overall, though, the, the issue is, you know, there used to be this, I guess there still is, this concept of universal design. And the problem with it is that it got um, essentially identified with grab bars in, in a shower. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so it, it, it kind of got looked down upon. My okay. first preference is, is to think about design for all. And just like marketing 101, if you have a marketing solution for your most difficult customer, that just means that you're going to have that much easier time to sell to the rest of your customers. Okay. If you, if you build into the design on the front end a user interface a uh, and, and, and tools that are intuitive and what Steve Jobs would have called simply, he wouldn't have put a label on it except to just say, <laughs> that's good, des- that's good design. Right. And for him, there was good design and there was bad design. And most of it was bad design. So just think about what makes, you know, a good, um, you know, uh, a good website. It's the number of clicks to get right. to what you want to get to, right? On a cell phone or, an, or, or, or on a smartphone, it's, it's how many things do you have to push to get to the activity that you want to actually engage in? And that's no different regardless of age. So when you design something that is simply easier to use, what that enab- en- en- enables is the company that produces that it, it, it allows them to penetrate the entire age continuum rather than be stuck, stuck in a niche of just the accessibility niche or the older right. market niche. And that, to me, is really the promise of several underlying technologies that are now coming to the fore, particularly with voice, artificial right. intelligence, machine learning, IoT. And we have yet to see all of those things one, fulfill their, to- their, their complete uh, uh, potential, but more interestingly, we have yet to see how they will come together in various combinations to enable a future, uh, a future activity. So do you feel like one of the barriers might be some of that social stigma, that if someone is making design so uh, so accessible and so at the forefront as to engage in a conversation where this is going to be easier for um, senior citizens to use, this is going to be easier for sight and hearing affected people to use, that they could be then linked with, this is the phone for old people, or this is the phone for the blind or the phone for the deaf, as opposed to really kind of sharing in that mass market idea of this is good design. I think you you mentioning Apple specifically, We could make an argument, I think some of our viewers would disagree with me, but we could make an argument that maybe a lot of the innovation happening in the Android space is change for the sake of excitement to talk about change, where it doesn't necessarily always represent improving interactions or improving uh, access to data or services. Yeah, well, I think I think that's true. Um, You know, I've been a Mac house uh, since 1984. So, you know, in, in my house, uh, let's see. You know, how did you, how did you function? You had Compaq at work and Apple at home? 
<laughs> yeah, uh, interoperability was it was, was a challenge, particularly in the days of, of, of Word Perfect and uh, you know and 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 other uh, and 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 other uh, programs. Um, yeah, yeah, there was a lot of printing out stuff. <laughs> uh, but in any case, um, you know, I think that the I'm I'm a Trekkie, right? And right. I and I and I've always you know, looked at Star Trek and Roddenberry's vision of what technology can achieve and how, and more importantly, the interface that the interfaces that he created between people and technology as, as frictionless, right? So going back to 1965, the first Bluetooth communicator, although it wasn't called that, was in Lieutenant Uhura's air, ear, right? And and, and it was you know uh, path breaking, um, and 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 it was path breaking in, in, in not just because of the technology, but also because this was an African American actress who was a key member of the cast in 1965. You exactly. Know, at, at the same year as the Voting Rights Act, so you know breakthrough in that in that regard. The first tablet, you know, Picard, you know, sitting in his ready room reading Shakespeare. You know, uh, <laughs> right. you know, the first 3D printing card again, going to get his Earl Grey tea, the first virtual reality, the, the holodeck, um, you know, talk about, you know, big data and machine learning. Its name was data, you know, yeah. and it was this Android that could do all these these things at the service of, of, of people. And. But I think the the and you know um, we're not we're not going to get into transporters. But um, you know I think the most significant view of the future that that Star Trek you know presented and is now starting to be realized is voice. And mm -hmm. so the very notion that you can simply speak into the air and stuff happens in response that to me is where the user inter interface starts to become frictionless. And that is the key, not just to accessibility for people who need extra help in right. accessing these technologies. That is accessibility for everybody. And well, that really is, you know, the potential of design for all. So we see Alexa, we see, you know, right. Google Home, we see Apple's you know, entry into it, Siri's going to get better and better. Um, so that to me is really where, uh, where the promise is. So, because this has been one of my sort of no evidence to support it hypotheses is uh, one of the reasons why it's so difficult to discuss, you know, accessibility settings on a phone, for example, is it's really difficult to envision how someone can interact with a piece of technology if they need to rely on those settings without someone else's help. Like you can't well, just, just crack think, open the right. box. So just, so just think about how many times you have to push the surface of your iPhone to find the accessibility settings. Exactly. And so envisioning this, and, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up Star Trek. We were, uh, cause I was raised on the original series before Next Gen came out and we're going back through and rewatching it. And I actually had to point out to my wife, I think it's in the third or fourth episode of the original series where Kirk leaves the bridge and he takes the, the helmsman with him and he tells Uhura, take the helm. And you're right. like, you've got an African-American woman piloting the Enterprise and no one blinks. Like right. no one comments right. on it. It's just like, that's how it works in the future. How cool uh, is that? And that, that was a really big deal, especially for its time. This one little throwaway interaction with a bridge crew member. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, but, it's, it's still ahead of its time. <laughs> Unfortunately, I would have to agree. Um, is, is this something that has become a, a part of the conversation with AARP members that these needs aren't being met without assistance from someone else or without additional handholding to kind of get us into um, how they can interact with things like smartphones or just the fact that these things are changing on such a radical basis? I, I know that's one of the reasons why I have been a little bit more active in recommending Apple as a potential solution for some of my family members, because I have a reasonable expectation that when they upgrade their phone, they won't have to relearn all the basics, right. how to use it, 
Whereas I don't always have the same the same confidence in something like a Galaxy phone maintaining a consistency of UI. Right. Uh, well, I'm 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 with you just as a user, uh, you know, with regard to Apple uh, products, and there's no question it was the iPad that came out and did in fact make touch screens possible for many older hands uh, that previously could not effectively use what was even a smaller iPhone uh, mm-hmm. interface. So, uh, so, so there's that. But what I was going to say was that, you know, these issues of um, uh, poor design, in a, insufficient design, insufficient uh, products that are just really uh, easy to use, intuitive, going back to plug and play and Mm -hmm. making it really literally plug and play. Um, I mean, I think that's a challenge for for people that need an extra, uh, you know, some additional assistance. But I think that's a a challenge for the entire market. Most of the stuff that is designed sucks. (laughs) <laughs> and, um, you know, and 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 so, you know, for example, if, if you have a device that is black and, you know, you're you're looking for um, the on off button or this or that. And you look and you see that the button is black and it's tiny and there's a two point font with a black raised writing with a black <laughs> background. You know, that's not easy for my kids to see and, right. you know, in their 20s than it is for me. So, you know, right. that's and, not and good bless for you for thinking that any modern phone actually even can dedicate the space for point two font anymore. <laughs> okay, so point one, whatever, you know, <laughs> or, or point point zero point five. Um, you know, the point is, is, is that it, it's it's insufficient. And, um, you know, so AARP has been sounding this alarm, we've been at, at, at CES, uh, mm-hmm. Every year for the last uh, eight years, nine years, uh, you know, kind of with a campaign around design for all. Um, my my AARP runs a demo day every year uh, called Innovation at 50 Plus Live Pitch. We've uh, for six years primarily focused on digital health and uh, and digital solutions for caregiving. Um uh, we, we had it last year at the uh, Computer History Museum in, uh, in, in Mountain View. Uh, we had it at the uh, Startup Accelerator Plug and Play in Sunnyvale the year before that. Um, we've had over a thousand companies apply mm-hmm. to be one of 10 on stage. Um, we have, you know, we only put 10 on stage. So out of that right. thousand, we've plucked seven, uh, 70 companies. And of those 70s, uh, 70 uh, finalists, about 31, 32 have raised over $180 million in venture investment. Another five companies have exited through acquisition. Um, we've had uh, 61 venture capital firms invest in those companies. We've had top shelf VCs who volunteer their time to be judges, whether it was Kostler or Kleiner Perkins or you name them. Um, and, and so, you know, the marketplace has to start to see that this is a market that is simply too big to ignore. And so if the solutions in the market right now are insufficient, well, that's the role of innovation. And it's the role of innovation, not just in this area, but but in all areas. You know, uh, 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 J.W. Wool, do you remember Woolworths? Yeah. Okay. so Woolworths was started by a guy named J.W. Woolworth. And what J.W., one of my favorite quotes of Woolworths was, I am a terrible salesman, so I have to make it easy for people to buy. <laughs> right. Well, and th- this is this is one of the things like I would have a concern with. So you're working, you're reaching out to these companies, you're having these kinds of discussions, you're putting them on stages, you're at tech conferences. And the, I would say maybe one of the current criticisms of the Silicon Valley uh, investor mentality right now is we've got a lot of great salesmen, mm-hmm. right? So in, in, in direct response to, you know, Woolworth's strategy there, he has to make it easy for people to buy. Are we finding, what kind of response are we finding though? You've, you've been at CES for eight or nine years, and this is a conversation that I still feel like many in our audience 
um, haven't been easy, haven't easily discovered or haven't easily contributed to, wouldn't the fear be this is really easy to pay lip service to? But then what do we see, like, you know, the put up or shut up? What what kind of responses do we actually see making it to market to improve the situation, not just for seniors, but for consumers in general? Yeah, well, I, I think there I think your 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 core point is is absolutely right. Uh, there is a lot of lip service. Um, uh, and, and I think that, um, you know, it's, it, 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 in many ways you'll have organizationally, you'll, you'll have, you know, in companies, you'll have like an accessibility group, mm-hmm. but it's really, it's really is an afterthought. It's like corporate responsibility. So, you know, corporate social responsibility, <laughs> right. it, it, it's, it's like that, it's like that thing over there, but those are things that need to be embedded and threaded through the life of a company. And it's just from a business standpoint, incredibly short-sighted to make it that separate type of thing. It's really an example of not understanding the potential of a growth of, of one of the only humongous growth markets that exists. Right. You know, and so I come out of strategy consulting. You know, I used to be a futurist with the Nesbitt Group. And when I look at these things, I'm asking myself, what planet are these people on? You know, <laughs> you know, you know, in, in, in Watergate, you know, the, the, the big takeaway from Watergate, aside from, you know, Nixon standing with his hands up, you know, on, on the uh, uh, getting into the helicopter when he resigned, the other takeaway was follow the money. Well, right. where's the money? This is the population that spends the money. And so, you know, we have continued to have a focus on younger people. Marketing dollars still are skewed to younger people. And there are, you know, myths about, you know, well, if you get them in young, you know, they'll be brand loyal for life. <laughs> no, they, no. They, 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 they absolutely will not. That might have been, I don't even know that it was true, you know, years ago, 50 years ago, but it definitely is not true today, particularly when you're in technology markets where new stuff comes along repeatedly. So right. you might have been a BlackBerry lover and then the iPhone, you know, bypassed it, you know, or you were a, a, a Nokia, you know, lo- lover or, you know, you know whatever. Um, or, or a moto, you know, uh, cell, you know, lover, you know, the things are coming hot and heavy and it's only going to be the companies that are able to constantly come up with a value proposition that answers the third question of strategy, which is right. why should you buy from me and not the other guy? Now that's, that, that's kind of the last point that I'd like to kind of end on though, is we see sort of this acceleration of the technology market where I, I think, you know, you were bringing up the classic BlackBerry days. It, it was sort of expected that there might be two years between a major shift in a BlackBerry product, right? These things would exist right. for a little while. And prior to that, it was a big deal when like a new desktop was released, a new IBM compatible PC. That was like a five year, 10 year strategy. No one ever got fired for buying IBM. Um, now and now and now you just have have software upgrades o- o- over your Wi-Fi. Well, and and do you feel like that's sort of contributing to maybe sort of a tech fatigue? I think we're starting to see the beginnings of that across the consumer consumer uh, spectrum in general. But this is also one of those things, you know, like there's the stereotype of grandma having difficulty using her iPad every time there's a major iOS update or an app changes on her folders is repositioned. Is that something that's becoming a part of the conversation for AARP membership? Yeah, I, I would I would say it's not a dominant conversation. Okay. Uh, and, I, and I think in terms of, you know, technology fatigue, when you see new products come along like the Amazon Echo, um, you know, if it serves a need, people get it, you know, and so, um, you, you know, you have an accelerator in Seattle right now that's funded by Amazon. It's run by uh, a guy I know from Techstars, you know, that, and it's all about building on the Echo platform. Well, we've seen products around caregiving that are being built on the Echo platform. Those things are then going to find their way into some kind of IoT connection Mm -hmm. 
Um, I want to see the day when my mother can walk into her house and just say, Harry, because she's renamed Alexa Harry. <laughs> Harry. I love it. Harry, I want to talk to Rachel. Who's that Rachel is my niece, her grandchild, who's in the Peace Corps in Nepal and only has access to broadband twice a month, knows what those days are, <laughs> right. can, then, can then schedule that FaceTime conversation between Rachel and my mother and then put up on the screen reminders to my mother, Harriet, just reminding you, calling next week, Rachel's going to be calling in four days, Rachel's going to be calling in two days, right. because my mother will have lost whatever she wrote down that appointment on. Right. And, and then all of a sudden, my mom's there in the, li in the living room watching the television, and there's Rachel. Right. Hey, now, Grandma. Now, for, for that, because this has also been one of the concerns that we've talked about with voice assistants in general, the amount of personal information, do you think we will, will be able to build an ecosystem that can address some of those concerns at the same time, protecting privacy, uh, protecting user data, you know, making sure that people understand, you know, sort of what's the safe behavior and what's not. I know that's got to be a part of the AARP mission is that kind of outreach and that kind of education. I think the, the biggest things for, for, for AARP are um, certainly privacy, um, but it's, it's, you know, privacy increasingly is in the eye of the beholder and it is increasingly, um, you know, opting out mm -hmm. as, or opting in as opposed to opting out, you know, it's, it, or, you know, you're, you're going to see those that are demand opt in and they're going to be those, you know, that are going to just be comfortable opting out. Um, privacy has to be built in. Uh, as we've seen, you know, with regard whatever how strong the firewalls, um, there's always somebody smarter who right. finds a way. Um, I think this is part of the reality that we that we're dealing with, and I think on the back end, things have to be done, certainly to prevent the break in, but then it's you know, once there is a break in. It's on the back end of protecting the people whose data has has been, you know, compromised. Uh, you know, so that's one thing. But the um, the the other uh, part of this is uh, it, it is also, you know, the the fraud and targeting of older people mm -hmm. uh, once you have that data, or you know, and that doesn't require you know great technology. You know, almost all of the scams these days. Our telephone calls. Wow. And really, and, 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 you know, uh, somebody will call and they'll say they're from Publishers Clearing House and you've won, uh, but you have to send them a check for $100 to get your check for $5 million. And, um, you know, and, and I've seen those kinds of things left and right. And it, this is a major issue that uh, our members um, feel very strongly about. And it's an area that AERP has rightfully. Uh, you know, focused on, you know, working with attorneys general, uh, you know, across the country, but also providing tools and education to people, you know, about what information they should volunteer, you know, over the phone or even, uh, you know, over, um, over over the Internet. So um, but that's really interesting to hear. So the, the stigma that, you know, grandma's falling for the Nigerian prince email scam or that their computers are getting hacked because they're clicking on ad banners really is kind of overblown that. The traditional, more human scamming, sort of a data mining, is is still the prevalent cause of that kind of abuse. Yeah, I don't have data on you know percentages, but but mm -hmm. uh, but but it's still you know the 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 you know the 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 old true and uh, steady you know still unfortunately seems to work all too often. But that that's also good news, I think, for the future of technological services that it would appear the protections are at least on the right track. I mean, they're obviously never going to be. Perfect. That's right. That's right. And so, for example, you know, there are companies uh, that startups um, that have been on our stage, like uh, uh, Eversafe and TrueLink, uh, Golden and others who are 
helping to fight, um, most importantly, by allowing families to to track, you know, financial activity Mm -hmm. um, and and to jump on it, you know, right away. I also think the banks are, are frankly, you know, just getting better. I mean, I know for myself, you know, I, I recently bought a new mattress you know, right. and, um, you know, it was a purchase very different than usual, right? You have, how often do you buy a mattress? And, <laughs> um, and, and, and so I, I got a phone call, you know, from, you know, the fraud alert guys, you know, at, at Chase, you know, to say, is this you and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, I think increasingly that'll be happening, uh, you know, as well. And the technology and that and, you know, and even on the fraud alert stuff, that's where artificial intelligence and machine learning exactly. and, and those underlying technologies are just going to get better and better. And so this really just reinforces the idea. I mean, we get hung up on things like Android updates or iOS updates that really it does seem to be that f- from your perspective, making improvements more seamless in the background, improving that data layer of AI being able to look through information. Um, it is really going to be the next major hurdle for improving services for everybody. And that comes with bringing more people into the tech fold from various communities, be they senior citizen or from right. other facing other disabilities or challenges. Right. And, and, and on the, um, on the services side, the ability of these technologies to help make recommendations that are much more personalized, uh, you know, you know, so for example, you know, in medicine, there's a lot of discussion now about personalized medicine. Really what it is, is genomic medicine. And because genomes are, are singular uh, and unique, uh, then people kind of, you know, generalize it to say that, that it's personalized medicine. It's not. It's, 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 it's molecular medicine. It's genomic medicine. Uh, what is missing is the person. <laughs> and the person, it's really about how they live their lives. And everybody lives their lives differently. Things are different or or have different uh, degrees of importance. Sure, we all have, you know, certain common theme themes that we all want, you know, uh, you know, uh, a a good quality of life and happiness and 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 social circles, except for, you know, the individuals that just want to be by themselves of all ages. But, um, you know, but had had your circumstances, your flow, your life flow, as, as my, uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Charlotte Ye says, um, you know, it's, it's when the products and technologies adapt to the person mm-hmm. rather than the person having to adapt to the technology. That's when it's right. That's when we have the, the, the right fit. We, ha- we had a question in here, and actually I think that kind of helps address it from a, a Twitter follower, Peter Hayton, um, talking about some of Google's recent pushes into mainstream adoption of things like augmented reality, their visual positioning service to help people navigate areas that they might not be familiar with. But that doesn't really seem to be you know, a, a service that should be focused on a particular demographic. That sounds like it should be something accessible to all kind of the last point you were making there that it really if we were to take the notion of you know who we're spending ad dollars on you know we're targeting youth markets the exciting conversations around what next social media sharing photo app is coming out this week and is going to be gone next week that that seems to be one of the last big hurdles to get over for improving the situation for everybody yeah no i i I'm I'm in complete agreement. Yeah. Excellent. Well, on that on that note of being in an agreement, <laughs> I think we should go and wrap this up. I really do appreciate you uh, taking the time to chat with some of this stuff. Where can people find? Because again, you know, I, I would imagine that most of our audience is probably too young to join the club, but it seems like there are still conversations worth having, and especially for relating to say older family members. Because we're often the people that are tapped uh, to make those purchasing decisions for our friends and family. Um, and where can they find more information on some of these topics which might be relevant for some of their older family members? Yeah, uh, well, two things. One, I, you know, what's really important is that the older person be at the center of innovation and that the older person be involved in those purchasing decisions. You know, PERS mm-hmm. devices, personal emergency response systems, the kind of I fall and I can't get up buttons. Right. Um, you know, half of those are in a drawer. 
and they're they're in a drawer because they were bought by an adult child without talking to the older person. And, you know, even the oldest and frailest do not want to wear something around their neck that communicates <laughs> right. like a neon sign. I'm old and frail. Right. right. You know, older people do not want to buy things. The old the older guy does not want to buy the car for the older guy. Right. Because right? in your head, you're not the older guy. In fact, we did research years ago to ask people what is old. And you know what what old is? Old is about 17 years older than you are, regardless of your age. <laughs> that actually makes a lot of sense, though. It, it, I don't. It, I don't feel like I'm. I'm an adult yet. <laughs> I feel like I will be in about a decade. <laughs> right. Well, ba basically, it's it's the next generation. The next right. generation is old. It's not me. And so you could have, you know, a 75 year old. Well, my in laws are 96. Right. Both of them. You know. That 75-year-old is still, you know, young whippersnapper compared to my in-laws and a generation away, in fact. So, um, you know, so, so we got to kind of, you know, ensure that, you know, innovation on the design side is involved. So I was telling you about our demo day. You know, right. all demo days have the same thing. They have, you know, venture capitalist judges, the entrepreneurs do their pitch. Somebody's chosen as a winner. But we do something differently because we bring in the consumer. Mm -hmm. So we have a judge's winner and a consumer choice winner because we bring in AARP members and we give them wireless voting devices and an open mic to provide real time market feedback to these entrepreneurs. And that is what is missing. So in the startup world, you can have all the discussion you want about lean startup methodology, which is premised on repeated iter iterative interactions with the consumer. Most right. startups and entrepreneurs don't have the time, the money, or the way to access, you know, the consumer. And so, it, you know, would it be better? Absolutely. But most, it doesn't happen. And so we saw that as, a, as, a, as an opportunity mm -hmm. to put the consumer at the center of, of innovation. If you're designing for this category of people, that category of people better have a say in, into what's being designed for people like them. So, so uh, in terms of where people can go for more information, mm -hmm. um, they can find it on uh, the uh, aarp.org uh, website. Another website to look at, which was started by AARP and United Healthcare with a focus on digital health, is called the longevitynetwork.org. And a lot of our studies, uh, they're all, you can download them for free. Um, we're trying to build more of a community and make it much more of a destination for entrepreneurs and investors and academia and, uh, you know, tech media. Um, and uh, anyway, well, those are those and are also that these are resources, go. which you, you like you mentioned, like we have access to those resources, even if we're not card carrying members of AARP, but that there are discussions there on those sites that can help inform us. You know what might be a way to approach an, an elder an elderly family member or someone with unique concerns facing something like digital mental health or uh, a, a, a home care or um, communications equipment in general um, as That's opposed right. to what you were saying because I I think you know you you really nailed it with I've fallen and I can't get up there are so many of these well-meaning well-intentioned products. Like, oh, I need to get that for my grandmother. And like, she's not going to ever use that. But she's totally comfortable using her iPad to FaceTime with her great granddaughter. Like, that's right. not a problem. Right. Or she learned to text by, because of her granddaughter. Exactly. Exactly. And so the, those, those types of conversations, I think, are, are important to kind of keep in mind. And that we have access to that information. We don't have to have an AARP login to get to some of that data. No, and I think and I think there's a larger issue here, which, which is how how can you be involved in the world at this time and be unaware, not just of the greatest demographic wave in the history of humanity. And we're talking billions of years of history. Right. Not only be unaware of it, but not be looking at the implications of that, because I would argue that there isn't a single industry, 
even in B2B spaces that doesn't have to be aware of, of this trend. It has implications across the board. And so it may not be obvious what those implications are, but that is certainly the conversation that has to happen. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, we'll, we'll put those links down in the, uh, the show notes for this video too, so people can click on those for, for more information. And uh, I, I really appreciate you uh, having this chat with us. It's something that, again, I don't think a lot of us are focused on, but there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of misconceptions regarding how these conversations. Thanks very much, Juan. Thanks very much. Thank you. Cheers. All right. Thanks. We're going to wrap this show up. I think I think this is a good idea to uh, wrap it up with. Yeah, I, I mean, a few, a few uh, sort of. Again, it, it's a. Uh, it, I I feel bad making an uh, an iPhone user jump through the Google Hangouts hoops <laughs> to, to, to get into a, a broadcast oh, it, like this, but I'm glad he was able to find his way. Oh, true. That's true. Hangouts is uh, iPhone, lovely stuff. <laughs> uh. But let's put a pin in it, folks. Uh, there you have it. Another episode of the Pocket Now Weekly has come and gone. This show is over, but the conversation continues on Twitter, where you can find Jules is at Point Jules. I'm humbly at Some Gadget Guy. And uh, for more information on accessibility and senior care, especially as it pertains to the uh, gadget and mobility lifestyle, we've got we'll have links below and in the blog post for this episode where you can find more information from AARP. Now, Pocket Now is around the web on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Google+, YouTube, and our home site, pocketnow.com, and in Espanol at es.pocketnow.com. Shows like this cannot exist without your support, sharing the weekly with your friends who love mobile technology, and dropping reviews anywhere you can review a podcast helps us spread the word. Once again, we want to thank this week's sponsor, Eero, for totally revolutionizing my home network and making it a lot easier to use. Uh, definitely check out that promo code for free shipping because they're helping us uh, support the Pocket Now Weekly. But ultimately, there would not be a show if it weren't for our listeners and subscribers who have kept us on the air since 2012. The Pocket Now Weekly will be back next week with all kinds of delicious technology goodness. So make sure.